The story of Ghana's independence as the first country sub-Sahara to achieve this feat from British colonial rule has many strands to it. At the end of the Second World War, the Allies were successful and Adolf Hitler had been vanquished. The Americans generally preferred a policy to release colonial territory back to the natives. The British had a system that kept decolonization as a sure option. Ghana, then the Gold Coast, was ripe and ready for this experiment. Its population was sufficiently educated, its society was modern, and the Gold Coast was rich. Yes, by 1945, the Gold Coast produced two-thirds of global cocoa. But the story goes back to the 13th century, and in this film, we will tell you the whole story, the ups, the downs, the victories, and the successes of Ghana's independence struggle. The West African country of Ghana, formerly the Gold Coast, gained independence from British colonial rule in 1957, but the story of Ghana's self-determination began centuries before that. The partitioning of the Gold Coast between the British and the Dutch occurred in 1872. In that year, the Dutch Gold Coast became a possession of the British Empire. Prior to that, the Portuguese had occupied the coast of Elmina by erecting the Elmina Castle in 1482. The Portuguese remained for 160 years until 1642. The British, however, held the territory for 85 years. The Gold Coast endured European invasion for 475 years, in total from 1482 to 1957. We are a people descended from forebears who have fought historic battles and endured heroic struggles through time for freedom and dignity and justice. Our coat of arms boldly announces that we value freedom and justice. There is a new African in the world. That new African is ready to fight his own battle and show that after all, the black man is capable of managing the whole of us. This Ghana will be defined by integrity, sovereignty, a common ethos, discipline, and shared values. It is one where we aim to be masters of our own destiny, where we mobilize our own resources for the future, breaking the shackles of the Gunnersburg colonial economy, and a mindset of dependency, bailouts and extraction. It is a Ghana beyond aid. Whereas the Portuguese and the Dutch were unsuccessful in exporting their languages to the colony, the British had early success with language. This culminated in the signing of the first agreement that legitimized British imperial rule, it was the Bond of 1844, signed on the 6th of March, a 110 years prior to independence. The Bond of 1844, the basis of British jurisdiction in the Gold Coast. Whereas power and jurisdiction have been exercised for and on behalf of Her Majesty the Queen of Great Britain and Ireland, within diverse countries and places adjacent to Her Majesty's forts and settlements on the Gold Coast, we chiefs of countries and places so referred to 
adjacent to such force and settlement, do hereby acknowledge that power and jurisdiction and declare that the first objects of law are protection of individuals and property. Human sacrifices and other barbarous customs, such as pioneering, are abominations contrary to law. Murders, robberies, and other crimes and offenses will be tried and inquired before the Queen's Judicial Officers and the Chiefs of the District, molding the customs of the country to the general principles of British law. Done at Cape Coast Castle before His Excellency the Lieutenant Governor on this sixth day of March in the year of our Lord, 1844. Well, the bond of 1844 was probably the first formal grant of uh, uh, power to the colonial government then to exercise jurisdiction uh, uh, within, within certain coastal areas. I mean, a much smaller area than uh, the then Gold or, or, or what emerged as the Gold Coast among some certain fancy chiefs, you know, including, if I may say so, a great grandfather of mine, Nana Utu of Abra. Probably more, more important for present day purposes is the date on which the uh, uh, agreement was reached, the site of 6th March which was later to be taken as our Independence Day. In the year of 1850, six years after the bond of 1844 was executed, the Gold Coast became a separate dependency of the British Crown. Separate, that is, from other West African territories. An ordinance was enacted to establish a legislative council for the Gold Coast, executive council and legislative council. So, in a sense, the history goes back to 1850. Um, at first, the governor had only two other members in the council, but gradually the scope of the council expanded. Of course, the governor was nominating other people from, from the Gold Coast. That meant the governor was directly responsible to London. The legislative council so set up introduced into the Gold Coast in 1852 the policy of taxation under the leadership of Governor Major S. H. Hill. The purpose for the task was thought to be reasonable and necessary, that in consideration of advantages of protection, natives should contribute to support the government. It was decided that the poll tax would be the most productive, least burdensome and most equitable. The proceeds from the taxes were to be applied to the public good in education of the people, in general improvement and extension of the judicial system, and to create greater facilities for internal communication and increase medical aid. All these were to be done after such deductions towards payments of stipends to the staff of the Crown and other expenses by or for the Governor-General the 70 local signatories were led by George Finn Agri, Chief of Cape Coast. The African unofficial members nominated to serve on the Legislative Council, James Bannerman, Merchant and Civil Commandant of Accra, Lieutenant Governor, George Kuntu Blankson, Merchant of Cape Coast, Robert Hutchison, Merchant of Cape Coast, Francis Chapman Grant, Merchant of Cape Coast, Samuel Collins Brew, Merchant of Anomabo, George Cleland, Merchant of Accra and Divisional Chief of Jamestown, William Hutchison, Merchant of Cape Coast, John Mensah Saba, Merchant of Anomabo and Cape Coast, James Harry Chitam, Merchant of Cape Coast, Chief John Vanderpoy, Merchant of Accra and Divisional Chief of Asher Town, Thomas Hatton Mills, Barrister of Accra, by 1868, the chiefs and the people were increasingly dissatisfied with the political direction of the British imperial authority, and the educated few were now canvassing for the chiefs to draw up measures for self-government and self-defence. Yes, the term self-government was first used in the Gold Coast for political mobilisation in 1868, almost 90 years before independence. 
call was made out of Mankesim to all people in Cape Coast and elsewhere to mobilize towards self-government. A newspaper called the Gold Coast Methodist Times offered relevant biblical text for the campaign against the bill. It published on its front page, the day after the bill, the following, Your land, strangers defar it in your presence. Isaiah 1-7 and Nehemiah 5-2, other men have our land. The Imperial Authority introduced a bill in 1897 to compulsorily acquire all unoccupied land within the Gold Coast, termed then as ownerless land. Resistance to this bill was created by the Aborigines Rights Protection Society. This political party, the first to be established in Ghana, was established on 4th August 1897 in the same year of the bill. John Mensah Saba became an instant intellectual and political hero when he led the thought that there is no such thing as an ownerless land in the Gold Coast. Because land in the Gold Coast belonged to the living, the dead, and the yet to be born. The bill was defeated and a new one with amendments was enacted. By doing so, Saba had saved the Gold Coast and the West African territories of the land issues between Ian Smith and Southern Rhodesia, now Zimbabwe. That has bedeviled Southern Africa and even persists till this day. John Mensah Saba and the Aborigines Rights Protection Society had solved a colonial and heritage problem by thinking and talking without firing a gun or riots. Saba therefore wrote his name in the Hall of Fame and thought leadership towards self-government. The activities of the Aborigines Rights Protection Society enabled a better structured campaign against imperial rule. The entire narrative against colonial rule received a significant boost upon the advent of the First World War, which was fought from 1914 to 1918. For instance, a newspaper in the Gold Coast, the Gold Coast Nation, had in 1915 asked a question on its front page, quote, what will be the effect on us natives as regards our condition after the war from the fact that there were so many black races fighting alongside the whites? Is there any difference in the souls of men who willingly have laid down their lives for the glorious British Empire?" Unquote. This matter became topical when news of the hefty compensation that the British soldiers dead and alive had received from the government as compared to the paltry sums or nothing at all received by the natives. The response was that in 1918, soon after the war, Governor Clifford had assured the Legislative Council that opportunities for Africans to serve would be extended. The following year, in 1919, two Africans were appointed to the executive levels, but not to very senior positions. They were C. E. Wilhouse Bannerman, a barrister as police magistrate, and Dr. C. E. Randolph as medical officer. Casely Hayford congratulated the government on what he called a tentative step forward. All of these matters occurred pursuant to the Clifford Constitution of 1916. Well, the Clifford Constitution was also a good one. It was an improvement. On, in fact, it was probably one of the first, you know, that attempted to cover the entire territory of the then Gold Coast. And um, the whole idea was to make it possible for the colonial government to exploit the people of Ghana, the people of the Gold Coast, and, and the resources of the Gold Coast at that time. Governor Clifford was also said to have achieved something significant in the economic modeling of cocoa politics. Here is Gareth Austin of Cambridge University. A cover. For him, the success of cocoa farming uh, in Ghana was a vindication for the argument that it was actually in Britain's interests to leave the land entirely in African ownership 
And this was the policy he also pursued when he became Governor General of Nigeria. But the uh, success of Ghanaian cocoa farming, which was very largely by the initiative of Ghanaians, such as, of course, um, Teti Kwashi, um, that was the evidence. And this was not simply a kind of moral argument, it was also an argument about what kind of capitalism, in a sense, works best in West Africa, what kind of what kind of economy would best satisfy the colonial government's requirement that it generated enough revenue to exceed its costs. He used our traditional chiefs as well as intelligentsia, that is the educated amongst us, to distill what was best in terms of development and to make sure that they were properly implemented. So in his time, you could see that many of the big names were, you know, somehow brought into the government through entirely democratic means. I mean, sometimes it was by appointment, you know. The African leadership was, however, not just interested in picking a post, but intended that Africans should be highly qualified to accept these posts. Hatton Mills and Casely Hayford had, for instance, urged that Africans and Europeans should be submitted to the same qualification examinations. So was Dr. F.K. Nanka Bruce, a famous medical practitioner who wanted the highest standards to be set by Africans. This atmosphere created a high demand for quality education from all Ghanaian families in the 1920s, such that Governor Clifford was led to remark as follows, quote, Never in the course of my experience of the tropics have I found a place where the people were so avid of education. The Gold Coast is the only country I fancy where a schoolboy is more anxious to go to school than his parents are to send him, unquote. Thus, by 1920, education became a frontline policy for the colonial government. Governor Gadisbeck outlined a 12-plan policy for education to be implemented by an educationist committee whose terms of reference included a long list of detailed matters and whose program of action extended all the way to 1930. The plan was to provide a first-class secondary school, a teacher training college and a university college. It was the first authentic effort by the colonial authority, the native intellectuals and the chiefs to provide high quality education for all children in the Gold Coast. The entire program was given such necessary stimulus upon the arrival of J.E.K. Agri, a Ghanaian from Anomabo who had spent 20 years studying and teaching in the United States. The foundation of Achimoto School was laid in March 1924 and soon thereafter, Reverend Fraser of the Trinity College Ceylon was appointed principal. Agri returned to become the vice principal. They both selected the staff and Agri's eloquence and advocacy towards native education has gained legendary status. Agri it was who said, if you educate a man, you educate an individual. But if you educate a woman, you educate a nation. Kweji Agri had not just led the making of Achimota, he had sown the seeds of a great people for a great nation. Kweji Agri, one of the founders of the Achimota School Project, wrote with stunning clarity, and I quote, Don't tell me what you know, show me what you can do. Fate and fortune have placed us with the responsibility and the penalty of Achimoto. The products of Achimoto School have always been active vessels in the formation of this nation's history, for better or for worse. We have a legitimate claim to much of what Ghana celebrates and a burden of responsibility for much of what it condemns. 90 years is a long time. It must be a period of some reflection. So the story of Achimota and the setting up of the Kolebu Teaching Hospital became the epochal occurrences of the 1920s and the 1930s. 
the story of Hachimota continues to make history relevant to today's leadership in Ghana. In this photograph, Reverend R.C. Bloomer was leaving Achimota after being the first principal. He was returning to Australia and he took a photograph with male and female prefects of July 1939. The lady seated to the right of Reverend Bloomer, circled, is Adelaide. She became Adelaide Akufuado, wife of the second president of Ghana and mother of the eighth president of Ghana, Nana Adodankwa Akufuado. Two seats from her is the lady in white, now circled, Victoria. She later became Victoria Chematin and is mother of Mr. Alan Chematin, the Minister for Trade and Industry in Ghana. We launched Fidelity Bank in October 2006 and prior to that we're a discount house and it had become clear that there was an opportunity in the market to create a truly world-class Ghanaian bank and so we set out to create this um, bank called Fidelity. In only the first year, we won at the Banking Awards the best growing bank. I think the most significant one has to be the recent one, the Bank of the Year Award at the 2016 Banking Awards. We also did very well as best bank trade deal of the year and uh, also the fact that we won the best bank for best corporate social responsibility for two consecutive years in 2014 and 2015. The banking industry is evolving and Fidelity is making a difference. To sustain the development in education and health that he had brought about, Governor Gordon Gudgesbeck designed an economic model that will pay for it and also be profitable to the imperial government in London. This model made the Gold Coast a producer of raw materials such as will be controlled and traded by the imperial government. Part of the resources thereof will be applied to pay off the project and the other part to finance the colonial administration. The imperial country will then develop the raw materials to tertiary products and sell to the colony and across the world. Sadly, this kind of model is still the standard nearly 100 years after Gadgetsburg. This Ghana, where we mobilize our own resources for the future, breaking the shackles of the Gadgetsburg colonial economy and the mindset of dependency, bailouts and extraction. It is a Ghana beyond aid. The 1920s ended on a sad note with the death of Kesley Hayford, one of the early successful nationalists and founder of the West African National Congress. Kesley Hayford was succeeded by Dr. J.B. Dankwa, a lawyer and philosopher who was forced to enter politics to fill the vacuum that Kesley Hayford's death had created. He, Dankwa, took over the 1927 Youth Conference and carried a touch of liberation through to 1947 when he met George Alfred Grant and together they drew up the plan for the national liberation in political terms being to create self-government in the shortest possible time. One of the major achievements of the Youth Conference under the leadership of Dr. Dankwa was the effort they made to secure a united Gold Coast between the colony and Ashanti Ashanti is a 300-year-old kingdom in central Ghana. The imperial authority had in 1943 promoted a statute entitled the Ashanti Advisory Council. The purpose of this council was to establish a separate legislative council for the Ashantis. In opposition to this, Dr. Dankwa and the Youth Conference drew up a 400-page memo entitled Things to Change in the Gold Coast and presented it to the Joint Provincial Councils of the Gold Coast, the Colony and the Ashantis. A four-man committee was formed to advise on the constitutional changes. That four-man committee included C.K. Akukosa, A.W. Kojo Thompson, R.S. Blay and J.B. Dankwa. The result was that the Burns Constitution of 1946, for the first time, regarded Ashanti, then including today's Bonohafo region and part of today's Western region, as part of the colonial territory. The other hero of this effort was the Ashanti Hene, or Sir Ajiman Prempe II, who, upon hearing Dankwa speak on the changes recommended, invited him and three others to a meeting in Kumasi to hear out the argument and convince himself that joining the colony was the right thing to do for the new nation. 
At last, he seemed convinced by Dr. Dankwa's advocacy and agreed that Ashanti should be part of the colony to form the new nation. If the 1946 Benz Constitution had a separate legislative assembly for the Ashantis, independence for Ghana may have been frustrated and the old colonial strategy propounded by Lord Lugard in Nigeria called Divide and Rule would have impeded the progress of the struggle. But Dr. Dankwa was there at the right time with the eloquence, the circumstance and the ceremony to achieve unity under the Benz Constitution of 1946. Thus, the Benz Constitution of July 1946 prescribed direct representation by the Africans. But it was still authoritarian in outlook and Dr. Dankwa called it outmoded at birth. The Gold Coast now seemed ripe for self-government based on the strength of the intelligentsia and a widely educated population as well as cocoa economics, which gave a healthy balance sheet. But I think the cocoa holdups were a very striking demonstration of the economic power of the organized cocoa farming movement. Because at the end of the Second World War, Britain had a huge shortage of dollars, having the cost of paying for the Second World War, essentially, borrowing a lot from the US and having to repay them, while British industry had been reoriented towards the war. And in this context, the great thing from a British point of view about cocoa was that it earned lots of dollars. The biggest market was the United States. And uh, that meant, uh, I suppose, two things. One was that there was an argument for retaining Ghana as a colony because it was being very useful. On the other hand, it also meant that Ghana was too valuable to take uh, risks with politically. The momentum around the demand for self-government in Ghana in the 1940s affected the sub-region. Here in this video, prominent Nigerians travelled to London to ask for self-government from the British Imperial Authority. We have come to the United Kingdom as delegates of the National Council of Nigeria and the Cameroons, chosen by our people in order to demand for a more democratic constitution to modify four laws affecting our lands, minerals and chiefs and to request the British government to grant us more political responsibility to enable us to take an active part in the management of our affairs within the framework of the British Empire. These were the very distinguished Nigerians that the world was initially exposed to. They were proud, highly intelligent and on a mission, both for Nigeria and for Africa. They granted interviews and gave speeches in full Aguada, and people took them seriously. The Guard of Honor is mounted by the Nigeria Regiment, many of whom, like the Queen's husband, wear the Burma Star. That is why everybody run, run, run. Everybody scatter, scatter. Some people lost some. After the difficulties with the Constitution of 1946, Sir Alan Benz and Lady Benz were recalled to London and they were replaced by Sir Gerald Creasy and Lady Creasy. By the time of the arrival of Sir Gerald Creasy, the Gold Coast was a modern society and very ready for self-government. The military of the Gold Coast had been well trained for decades and was now ready to defend the Gold Coast by sea, by land or by air. Social life was bustling and the British and the intelligentsia as well as the chiefs related cordially, attending social functions together all the time in Accra and in Kumasi. Even the football rivalry between Ghana's two greatest football clubs, Accra Hatsafok and Asante Kotoko, had begun and it was staged at the very highest level to be seen by governors and some of the most influential people in the society. The outstanding matter in the Gold Coast was then the political machine to achieve self-government. This was created in 1947 
on the 4th of August at Salt Pond in consequence of a meeting between Dr. Dankwa and George Alfred Grant, who was a principal initiator of the United Gold Coast Convention, what would become the second political party in Ghana after the Aborigines Rights Protection Society, which was also formed on 4th August, 50 years earlier. He saw that there were so much trouble everywhere, so he wanted the white people to <laughs> go away. He wanted to sack them. So he called Dankwa and asked him if he could get about six lawyer friends of his so that they could sit down together and discuss. I remember some of them. I remember Kwaje, Kwaje, Obichabalamte, Lawyer Blay, Lawyer Williams. They had the meeting at Father's house in the dining room. And we always, the children in the house, when we saw these people coming, big people coming, we line up at the, on the veranda just to see them. We didn't hear what they were saying, but we wanted to see them. So we were all, when, as soon as they started coming, we all lined up at the corridor there. Surprisingly, when I come on holidays from school at Tetsumota, they used to have all these meetings and so on. So I enjoyed it. The leaders of the UGCC continue to enjoy cordiality as they plan to take over the reins of government. It was decided that one of the members of the UGCC was to be a full-timer running as general secretary to spread the philosophy of the UGCC around the country. Then Akwaji said he had a friend at, in London. And father said, write to him and ask him if he would like to come. And then Akwaji wrote to uh, Kwame Nkrumah and within a month a letter came to say that he would like to come. So Father Sant gave uh, Akwaji 100 pounds to send to him to come. As soon as he got the money, he came. And uh, father sent his car to pick him at the harbor from Tapuari Harbor. And he came and stayed in our house for some time. My father, Professor Nketia, was a very good friend of Nkoma. And they were in the African Union together. And they met in London University. And my father said that when Nkoma was coming to Ghana, they met at the dining table and he said, Kwabina, have been invited to be secretary for UGCC. And he said he was surprised because Nkrumah really did not have Ghana as his name. It was Africa. Anytime they spoke, it was Africa. He had a bigger vision. Africa, there's Africa must unite Africa. You know, so when he said he had been brought, you know, Park Grant had brought money for him to buy a ticket. I'm going to Ghana. I was like, really? Sometime after his arrival, disagreements occurred between Dr. Kwame Nkrumah and Dr. J.B. Dankwa in terms of philosophy, in terms of plan, and in terms of action. When they started their uh, office at uh, Sopol, then Dankwa saw a letter that uh, Kwame Nkrumah has written to the Soviet Union, and he said they weren't dealing, they didn't want to deal with the Soviet Union, so he shouldn't 
right to them. At the time, Kwame got upset and stopped talking to Dankwa. Before the disagreements reached the height, the reals of 28 February 1948 had occurred and had supplied sufficient oxygen to the liberation struggle. The route itself was sparked by indiscriminate shooting of protesters who sought better retirement conditions after fighting in the Second World War. Three gallant soldiers, Sergeant Ajete, Corporal Atipo, and Private Odate Lamte and others were killed at the crossroads in Accra. The rouse led to the arrest of the leaders of the United Gold Coast Convention, who later became known as the Big Six. The Big Six were thus invited to appear before the Watson Commission that led to the formation of the Kusi Committee, which was charged to draw up a constitution for the colony to replace the Alan Benz authoritarian constitution. This constitution was to have a fully elected Legislative Assembly of Africans only. The work and publicity around the Kusi Committee was so wide that they were mentioned at every public event, including here at the coronation of King Takekomi in 1948. The old polo ground at Accra, capital of the Gold Coast colony, British West Africa, is the scene of a memorable occasion in the history of the Ga state. Today, for the first time, a new Ga paramount chief is to be presented to the governor at a Durbar. In the past, new chiefs were always introduced to the governor at the official residence, Christiansborg Castle. But now it's a public event. The people of Accra are able to witness a ceremony that is very dear to their hearts. Many chiefs attend the ceremony, each under his state umbrella and wearing his traditional robes. The procession moves to the sound of drums, the firing of rifles and the chanting of tribal songs. It's a day of rejoicing. The Gar Manche, in whose honor the reception is being held, is on his way. He is Ni Taki Kami II, who is elected to office in December 1948. On one side of the ground sit civil and military officials and their wives, and a large number of guests, both European and African. Among them are the chairman and members of the Kusi Committee. Among them are the chairman and members of the Kusi Committee. Among them are the chairman and members of the Kusi Committee. The circumstances of history has determined that the eighth president of Ghana is a direct descendant of three of the big six. His father, Edward Akufuado, who was also president of the Second Republic. His maternal uncle, William Oforiata, who unsuccessfully ran for president in the Third Republic. And his granduncle, Dr. J.B. Dankwa, the doyen of Ghana politics. Nkoma and Dr. Dankwa they didn't agree at all on some things. But before he left UGCC, unknowingly, he had his secret meetings with some young men. And he schooled them that when they saw Dankwa, they should insult him. So one day, they had meet, a meeting at Father's room and suddenly they heard a lot of noise. So Father went to the window to see what was happening. And as soon as they saw Father, they stopped the noise. Then when Father left the window, they started again. So Dankwa got up and also went to the window. How they insulted him. They had a song that they sang. Shall I sing it? <laughs> <coughs> Down kwa kwa men kurma ya wodan Down kwa kwa men kurma ya wodan Nyamwan wa kran mo fia buetri ba ya Down kwe kwa mya ya wodan Nyamwan wa kran mo fia buetri ba ya Down kwe kwa mya ya wodan 
had a song they used to sing that day. And they started hooting at the people who were having a meeting at Father's uh, uh, office. Whilst the Kusi Committee's work was pending to create a constitution for Ghana that would lead to full independence, the disagreements between Dr. Kwame Nkrumah and Dr. Dankwa broke the front of the only political party, the United Gold Coast Convention. This led to Dr. Kwame Nkrumah in 1949 forming a new political party, the Convention People's Party. It was presented as a mass organization and it won the elections produced out of the constitution in 1951. Accra, capital of Ghana, went wild with joy when Dr. Nkrumah was released from political imprisonment in 1951. His enthusiastic followers had elected him to power. The independence of the former Gold Coast colony was thereby assured. Dr. Nkrumah thus formed the first all-African government and became the leader of government business. Upon assuming office as leader of government business, Dr. Dankwa wrote to Nkrumah congratulating him as follows. My dear Kwame, this is a glad occasion. You have fought a good fight and triumphed for the justice of our cause. Your imprisonment and your release are symbolic of the conquest of our imperialism. You may have made mistakes, as even the greatest do, but you have passed through a baptism of fire, a spiritual fire, and you have suffered bodily in the course of our motherland. May God bless you. Yours sincerely, J.B. Dankwa. But what was the main difference between Dr. Dankwa's self-government in the shortest possible time and Dr. Nkrumah's self-government now? We can find the answer in a letter Dr. Dankwa wrote to Dr. Nkrumah as follows. The ball that was set rolling in Second D and Salpon in 1947 culminated in the Watson Commission of 1948 and the Kusi Committee of 1949. I appeared before both the Commission and the Committee and the international recognition achieved by me as a doyen of Ghana politics has never been disputed. The Watson Commission recommended that the people of Ghana were fit to achieve independence within 10 years, and this actually happened almost on the dot, namely March 1957, 10 years from my meeting with George Grant. That was the shortest possible time. It could have been made shorter if, for instance, you had accepted my amendment for a declaration of independence as a substitute for your motion of destiny by which you asked the British to grant us self-government. But you rejected my amendment on the ground that we would, if it was accepted, thereby forfeit our British goodwill. Had my motion for declaration of independence been accepted by you, as was the case in the Sudan, we could have had our independence in 1954. That is to say, 110 years after the bond of March 1844. As it is, the event came in 1957, 113 years after the bond. But all this is a matter of history. Independence is won at last. And what we do with our mother Ghana, our sweet Ghana, is the heaviest of Ghana's burdens today. So independence in the shortest possible time could have been earlier than independence now. This irony may be resolved by considering the fact that once Dr. Nkrumah had won the elections and led the government in 1951, the narrative about independence now may have changed. Dr. Nkrumah may have wanted more time to determine other matters, especially the geographic makeup of Ghana. Thus came the Togo plebiscite, by which part of Togoland, originally a German territory, but after the Second World War became a French territory, also now became part of the Gold Coast. The 1951, up to the 1954, and even including the 1957 independence constitution, were all development-oriented and Ghana implemented a public and private sector industrialization policy to global admiration. Then he brought in Arthur Lewis to write for Ghana the first five-year development plan to guide the economic development of this country. So in his plan, 
He encouraged the government to set up industries. Government and private enterprise factories turn out the goods which Ghana needs. This is the Development Corporation's nail factory at Accra. With more and more building, more and more nails. Nails to make fine furniture in another government-sponsored enterprise. Great opportunities exist in many other fields. The international investor will survey possible markets which extend beyond Ghana itself to the vast awakening territories of Africa north of the equator. The people want furniture and household articles of all kinds. And moreover, they want the best that their money can buy. In the field of heavy engineering, the Ghanaian worker has proved his ability to master the many skills and techniques necessary. Today, more and more kinds of production are being undertaken. And more and more articles of every kind are bearing the title Made in Ghana. A good example is the lorry assembly plant at Tema. Here, records have been broken by Ghanaians with no previous engineering experience. Production is already double the expected figure, and the workers may be recognized in a new skilled category to be known as motor assembly technicians. Every day that passes sees another seven chassis complete. Experience has already shown that, in industry, the Ghanaian is an able, cheerful and willing worker with a passion for learning and advancement. Cigarettes, too, are manufactured in Ghana. At the Pioneer Tobacco Company's factory at Takaradi, local leaf, over 50% of it, is blended with imported tobacco to suit all tastes. 550 people are employed, and of the 42 management staff, 17 are Ghanaian. Each of the making machines can turn out 1,250 cigarettes a minute, which, with a bit of arithmetic, gives the plant an output of nearly 10 million cigarettes a day. Apart from its contribution to the consumer market, the company spends some 75,000 pounds a year on developing the local tobacco crop. And in two years, output has risen from 17,000 pounds of leaf to over 2 million. A modern canteen serves the workers. And after a good meal is an ideal time to enjoy the results of one's labors. A lot of cigarettes needs a lot of matches. And a lot are made at the caddy factory. 600,000 gross a day. The name Ghana, found by Dr. Dankwa, was used as the new name for the new nation. Independence was achieved and Dr. Nkrumah became the first Prime Minister of the Republic of Ghana. I, Prime Nkrumah, do solemnly swear that I will well and truly exercise the functions of the high office of President of Ghana, so help me God. Black Star of Africa unfurls. Two men are waiting to greet the Queen's envoy, arriving to set the seal on Ghana's freedom. Sir Charles Arden Clark, Governor General of Ghana. And our first Prime Minister, Kwama Nkrumah. I was then in Lagan as a student to read in economics and uh, we had a lot of high level delegates from all over the world coming to Ghana's independence. I was an aide de to the Thai ambassador in London who represented Thailand at the independence celebration. We had Nixon representing the United States. And 
and uh, many others. But the students in Legon were asked to add as a decon for these uh, representatives of their country. Ghana is the name, Ghana, we wish to proclaim, we will be jolly, merry and gay, the 6th of March, Independence Day. I offer my warmest good wishes for the future happiness of Ghana. May God bless and guide your endeavors. At the State House that night, Princess and prison graduate were dancing together. One year after independence, the government passed the most obnoxious law in the history of Ghana. It was called the Preventive Detention Act. Many Ghanaians, including frontline opposition members and later even senior government ministers, were arrested under the law or fled the country for safety. Ghana was becoming an unhappy land to dwell in. Fathers were afraid of their friends and were even afraid of their children. Incidentally, and quite controversially, this obnoxious bill was signed into law by the British governor at the time. I was then a student in Ghana when the Preventive Detention Act was uh, enacted. And uh, 58, 59 academic year, I was the president of NUCS, Legan. We had passed a resolution condemning the Preventive Detention Act. And I remember Nkrumah was in Lagos, a state visit, when the news came out. It was announced at one o'clock news, and Nkrumah happened to be in Lagos. I hear he was extremely annoyed. And as his, uh, when he came back, he asked his uh, education minister to look out for those students. And to punish us. Whilst the dust had not settled on the horrendous application of the Preventive Detention Act, an Act of Parliament received again the governor's accent on the 20th of February 1960 to allow the existing parliament to constitute itself into a constituent assembly to write a new constitution that would usher Ghana into republican status with a president who will be given wide ranging powers. The wide-ranging powers of the president and the fact that Dr. Nkrumah as president had no fixed tenure, no opportunity for a general election, were all captured in Article 10 of the 1960 Constitution. Dr. J.B. Dankwa mounted a famous and spirited challenge to the legitimacy of the Preventive Detention Act at the Supreme Court in Ghana, where he locked horns with the Irishman Geoffrey Bain, who was at the time Ghana's Attorney General. Dr. Dankwa argued that the PDA, as it was called, was an anti-human rights law and therefore needs to be outlawed and expunged from the books. He argued further that the president's solemn oath of office to protect all Ghanaians and not to discriminate on grounds of politics was to be construed by the court as a bill of rights. The court, however, upheld the argument of the attorney general and held that to the extent that the law had been passed as an act of parliament, it was superior to the constitution. The court further held that the president's solemn declaration did not constitute a bill of rights. Later on, Dr. Dankwa was arrested under the PDA and was sadly to die in prison. The doyen of Ghana politics, the man whose intellectual industry brought Ashanti and the colony together to form the new nation, and the man to whom the new nation owed its name, died in prison, suspected to be an enemy of the nation that he had helped to create.
By 1964, Ghana was now a one-party state. Most of the president's focus was on continental and global affairs. The ambition towards African unity had consumed the best energies of Dr. Nkrumah's government. On the 24th of February 1966, while the president was away on an international trip, the soldiers and police struck to remove Dr. Nkrumah. The first coup d'etat in Ghana had been recorded on 24th February 1966. The coup was led by a military general named Kotoka. Newspaper headlines report the spectacular overthrow of Kwame Nkrumah and jubilant crowds celebrate his downfall in the streets of Accra. The military coup in Ghana is the seventh successful revolt in Africa in nine months. But none of the ousted governments have survived as long as Kwame Nkrumah. General Arthur Ankara, father of 22 and former mission school teacher, a man who's never concealed his dislike of Nkrumah. Before dealing with Mr. Amir, he had more important business. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, firstly, I would like to introduce my colleagues to you, some of the members of the National Liberation Council. As you've already been told, I need no introduction myself. But on my left here is the Commissioner of Police, Mr. Harley, who is the Deputy Chairman of the National Liberation Council. On my right is Major General E.K. Kotoka, who is the second member or the first member of the National Liberation Council. Uh, we have called you here this morning for one specific reason, and that is this coup was carried out completely because of the things that had happened in Ghana and of the, of the, uh, because of the tyranny and the partisan of Kwame Kwame Nkrumah, the deposed president. Everybody in Ghana was fed up with it. And therefore you could see the spontaneous uh, result which uh, followed the coup. You would have seen when you were coming probably thinking that Ghana would have been put under curfew or all other things, but nothing was done. There was no brain behind it, it was work from us and from within without the aid of anybody, any foreign country or any country. The coup leaders prepared Ghana towards the Second Republic and the new constitution. Under the constitution, elections were held under the universal adult suffrage. Dr. Nkrumah's party, the CPP, was however banned from participating in the election. The results led to the swearing-in of Prime Minister Kofi Abrifa Buzia, a professor in sociology from Oxford University and President Akufuado, who had been Chief Justice and also an alumni of Oxford University. We cannot be economically independent unless the economy of Ghana and the whole financial network is to a large extent in the hands of Ghanaians themselves. My Lord Chief Justice, Commissioners, Nananum, Your Excellencies, Members of Parliament, Ladies and Gentlemen, we present to you Dr. Kofia Prefer Busia, by the grace of God, Prime Minister of the Second Republic of Ghana, and request all manner of persons to recognize and acknowledge him as such. The government of the Second Republic was soon overthrown by a coup d'etat 
which led Ghana to the Third Republic. Long live the Ghana Armed Forces. Long live the revolution. Long live the National Redemption Council. Long live Ghana. As you go home, remember that the revolution continues unaffected. The Third Republic Constitution produced an election which was won in the second round by Dr. Hila Liman, a Foreign Service top official and who had also graduated from the School of Oriental and African Studies, SOAS, at the University of London. And to do right to all in this manner of circles, I further solemnly swear that should I. The Third Republican Constitution was also overthrown, and then came the Fourth Republican Constitution, which has now produced five presidents. The first president was Flight Lieutenant Rawlins. Mr. Rawlins gave sufficient stability to constitutional rule. Next was Mr. J. A. Kufour, another Oxford alumni, who recorded high economic growth, growing the country's GDP from 4 billion to 16 billion, and also significantly discovering oil for Ghana. The next was Professor Mills, another graduate from SOAS, who was an apostle of peace. He produced first oil for Ghana, but Professor Mills was to sadly die in office. President John Dramani Mahama became the fourth president after Mills and was the first to win an election upon the first attempt after flight left to Rawlins. The acceptance of constitutional rule now seems to be a part of Ghanaian life. Some people believe that the constitution, having been sufficiently tested on few occasions, had stood the test of time and had gained the confidence of the people. Well, you know, the 1992 constitution was crafted um, in circumstances where we are undergoing a transition from military and autocratic rule to democracy and constitutional rule. So there are many people who feel that it was influenced a lot by Rollins. Um, so there are not transparent and inclusive in most cases, the president appoints in consultation with the Council of State. The Council of State, many people feel it's more or less a lame duck. Nobody knows how it operates. Um, Eleven of its members are selected by the president. And uh, nobody knows what advice it gives to the president and whether the president accepts its advice or not. The other major challenge is the election petition of 2012. After the elections of 2012, the losing candidate decided to test the constitution and to file a petition against the declaration of his opponent as the winner of the election. The petition dragged for eight months and eventually a verdict was given in favor of the announced winner, President Mahama. The losing candidate did not appeal against the ruling. Instead, he gave a widely applauded concession speech. In the circumstances, the overall effect is that the first uh, respondent was validly elected and the petition is therefore dismissed. Our various judgments for the sake of convenience are handed over to the Registrar of this court. Whilst I disagree with the court's decision, I accept it. I accept that what the court says brings finality to the election dispute. We shall not be asking for a review of the verdict so we can all move on in the interest of our nation. Everything in my bones, in my upbringing, and in what I have done with my life thus far makes it imperative that I accept a decision made by the highest court of the land, however much I dislike or disagree with it. Eventually, as fate would have it, the losing candidate was to be elected in the 2016 election in a landslide victory to become the fifth president under the new constitution. The president, as I've known him for several years, is somebody who exhibits sheer tenacity 
the very determined man and the spirit of can do. The whole notion that nothing can be done once you put your mind to it. And over the years that I've known him, he's been somebody who's made references to his um, uh, uncle J.B. Dankwa, to his father and mother, and the fact that they kept telling him that when you do one thing and you are not successful, you do it again, you try again, and you stay determined and get it done. So the whole notion and spirit of can do, um, having the capacity and the belief that if you put your mind to something, you will be able to do it. There's one thing that I believe um, which is about him, which has inspired a lot of us who followed him over the years. And it's a spirit and an attitude which motivates young men and women who've had an association with him. I, I, Nana, Ado Danfa, Akufu Ado, do in the name of the Almighty God swear. Do in the name of the Almighty God swear that I will bear true faith that I will bear true faith and allegiance to the Republic of Ghana. There is not much more I can say on the subject beyond wishing the government of Nana Dodankwa Kufuado well in this regard. He does not seem to lack much in terms of cerebral capacity. Success, however, will turn on how much his government can convert that cerebral capacity of his and of his team into impactful action. That should I at any time break this oath of office, I shall submit myself, I shall submit myself to the laws of the Republic of Ghana, to the laws of the Republic of Ghana, and suffer the penalty for it, and suffer the penalty for it. So help me God. So help me God. Thank you very much for watching. That's our effort in helping to set up the chronology of Ghana's history. We have done this through the laws that have occurred in Ghana since the bond of 1844. We hope that you enjoyed all the film and you can send us your comments and your consent and what you would like us to do with other films and other themes um, to our Facebook page for our TV program Good Evening Ghana Official is our Facebook page or send your comments to brandrepublicghana at gmail.com and we'll respond. Thanks for watching.